Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Saturday and it's overdue time for an Ask Me Anything because I normally do them on Friday. Uh, usual rules apply. Comment anything you want below this video and I'll get back to you in next week's video. Um, so before I go on to last week's questions, house admin, there are two things. I wrote it down as well, but the first thing is apologies for the delay in this video. The sound is probably a little bit different and a bit more boomy. Uh, I've been redecorating, even though this is the temporary studio while I get the garden one built. Uh, I got to this stage in the house of redecorating, so I've sort of juggled things around and it all sounds very, very different now for me. Uh, I don't know if it is for you guys, but I've literally just finished about 10, 15 minutes ago getting my equipment and computer set up, which is why this video is a little bit late. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, which I should have looked up, uh, it's next week. This is irrelevant to any of you that aren't living in or near Manchester. But on the 18th, so we've got a couple of weeks actually, on the 18th uh, a friend of mine is setting up a Guinness World Record of the world's biggest, or yeah, biggest back-to-back -back set. So it's I think like 160 DJs going back-to-back. -back. Uh, it's all for charity, it's all for a good cause. I'll be playing there myself. Uh, I'll post more info, I'll drop a link below this video, it's probably easier, there's a Facebook event, I think. Um, but yeah, we've got a couple of weeks yet, so I will mention that probably more in next week's video, but I just wanted to drop that this week. Uh, I think that is it for House Admin, so I'm going to look at last week's questions. Starting in the beginning, Zombo! Uh, this AMA took a deeply personal turn. My respect for you just went up a lot. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I saw that comment come through and I wondered which bit was personal. Um, there's probably a couple of bits in there, to be honest, if I'm honest. But, um, yeah. Uh, Kavake. Dom, thanks for such a useful and actionable answer. And a great AMA in general, as usual. No question this week, in the process of moving house but I'll be watching on Friday, uh, Saturday. Uh, good luck with your house move. I know how much of a nightmare it is, uh, especially when you've got all this sort of equipment and crap to lug around with you. Um, I feel like I've literally just moved house now, um, even though I got here six months ago. Uh, cheers, Instagram, high five. P.S. I think I was one of your merch no-shows. Apologies, I'll rectify that as soon as the dust settles and the cash stops hemorrhaging outwards during the move. Do not worry about it. It's not a big deal. Um, it's just one of those things, really, isn't it? Uh, DC Links. Hi, Dom. I have a few questions regarding the business side of things. What are the differences between a record label and a publisher? I think that's a good question, probably a more prominent question in this day and age. They used to be two very different beasts. So... Uh, you have two forms of copyright, we'll say. There is the copyright of the master recording. That is your final mixed and mastered WAV. And then you've got the copyright of the idea. Uh, and that's the, 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 the writer credit rather than the artist credit. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way of explaining it. So a record label signs the master rights from you and they have the opportunity to sell that record as a finished version of a track. Um, and they are only allowed to sell that assuming they only sign the master rights for, of your track. Which means you could, in theory, get if you still own your writer copyright, then in theory you could do a cover version of your own track or somebody else could do a cover version of your track and providing it's all credited and cleared on the publishing side, then the record label don't really have a say on whether that's allowed or not because they only own that, that finished master recording. 
So that's kind of fundamentally the difference, I suppose. You, you've got, you can copyright the final recording and you can copyright the idea, which is the, the chords and melody together as an idea or the lyrics and the vocals. And, and uh, so there's, there's two forms of copyright, really. Um, a publisher will look after the the writing, the idea, the creative side of that record, um, which means if, for example, somebody wants to do a cover version and release it, you know, um, say they want to broadcast it on an advert on TV or something like that, then they would need the permission from the publisher to do that rather than the record label. However, it gets more complicated than that because a lot of record labels these days recognise that there is sometimes more money in synchronisation, which is when your music is synchronised to a film or TV advert or TV show or something like that. So they will usually not only take the master rights from you, but they will also take you know, anything up to 50% of your, your publishing rights as well. Um, somewhat questionable and it's always debatable and, and there is no right or wrong answer here, to, in my opinion, because if, if a record label owns part of your publishing rights, then they're going to be more interested in getting it synchronized to TV and film and things like that. So so it's in their interest to do that and depending on their back record and their back catalog and their history and what label it is and how hard they work then it might be in your interest to do that as well. However, I I would say it's it it's a tricky one basically because if you're signing everything over to one person, they could easily just do nothing with it and that's really not in anyone's interest but it happens so um i guess that's probably the best i can explain off the top of my head what are your experiences with publishing agreements and contracts and would you recommend this so there are lots and lots of self-proclaimed publishers out there there are lots of companies out there i won't mention any at this point because i don't have hard evidence but there's one in particular that i was looking at what last week the week before with a couple of colleagues and we started figuring out based on some information we started looking at their services and their payment structures and how they work and we figured out it was a bit of a scam so what I will say is that there are companies out there that will claim to get synchronizations and they will offer you a subscription or you pay them to get your work placed on their catalogue. I will say out and out right now, do not do that. Do not pay a penny for anything. It's your music. They should want you. They should be paying you, if anything. Uh, if you're ever given any kind of opportunity where you have to pay to have your music placed anywhere, then do not do it. That should be ringing alarm bells with you. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of companies out there that do this. There's also several online companies that claim to be getting synchronizations in big Hollywood films and things. And they may be doing that but there's also a good chance that they're only doing that because they've signed a hundred thousand tracks from artists and they're just, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall until something sticks. Um, you know, it's, it's, and that's not the way it should work. Um, especially for us as individual artists, we don't want to be just a drop in the ocean. Um, no matter how big or small this label or publisher or whatever is or whatever what any kind of deal we don't want to be a drop in the ocean so um don't go for that however i have uh a deal with a publisher um and i actually self-managed all my publishing for many many years and i worked with a lot of library companies that that 
take a cut for managing individual tracks in your library and I'm happy to do that on a track by track basis. Um, it's only last year after nearly 20 years of doing this, it's only last year that I signed up to a publisher and that's because I had a history and I had a catalogue and I already had a lot of synchronizations and things going on so I was in a good negotiating position so I was able to get a good contract where um, it's a essentially a rolling 30-day contract and I can choose which tracks they sign and which tracks they don't so if for example I sign a track to a record label that wants to take the publishing and I think it's in my interest for them to take the publishing then I can just go with them um, if I want to just put a track out on a, a library company then I can do that and if I want to publish it myself and self-manage I can do that or I can give it to my publisher and let them manage it and they also deal with a lot of synchronization stuff as well so sometimes it's in my interest to to give it to them and let them manage it they get a lot of briefs through um, and they're, they're very active I think they've actually got a few Netflix original scores recently which is great um, so yeah, so it's it's very long-winded, it's very complicated. I could talk for hours about this sort of stuff, but hopefully that kind of gives you a rough idea. Um, as for recommendations, it's really tricky, but I would, I would also say when it comes to contracts, make sure there is a, a term, a period set, um, whether it be a record label deal or publishing deal or whatever, do not hand over your rights for perpetuity. It's not... It's not in anyone's interest to have your music for life. Um, it shouldn't ever work like that. A lot of labels try and sign it for life. Um, that's not a good deal. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons why that could not be a good deal. Um, it could be that, say you release, I don't know, 10 tracks with a label and they don't really do anything, but it is what it is. And they've signed it for life. And, and couple of years later you're looking back at these tracks and you think oh they were shit it's fine whatever you know they're not going anywhere then you release one track with a big record label and it goes global I mean it becomes smash hit you become a superstar overnight you're going to look back at those 10 tracks and think oh, I really don't want them out in the public and that label and I'm sure many of you watching this know a good example of where this has happened <coughs> play records um where an artist has shot to fame overnight and that label has just constantly re-released old tracks over and over and over again. I've had it myself to an extent where I've released a couple of tracks on Mousetrap and there's been a, a, a remix I did 10 years ago just gets re-released the day after my Mousetrap release and it's because they're cashing in on Beatport new releases and my name climbing the charts and people going, oh, I'll buy that one as well. Uh, it's not a very nice thing to be on the receiving end of um, and again you know so labels that have done that to me before I've then approached them and gone what are you doing can you just take it down please I want my track back and usually it's way past the say two three four five year expiration date of that contract anyway so I can just go take it down and they'll take it down and there's no argument then um, and I think that's a really important thing. There needs to be a clause where, you know, if you shoot to fame and fortune or if you just completely change direction, you know, you're doing drum and bass one minute and then you want to do kids' birthday music the next minute, I, whatever it is, you know, um, there could be a whole host of reasons that at some point in the future you want your rights back and as an artist we shouldn't be cornered forever. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that covers it. Uh, lastly, let's say you're in a current publishing deal and you sign a track to a label who is not affiliated with the publishing company. How do the royalties break down between the label, publisher and the artist? So I kind of touched on that at the beginning. Um, the record label own the master recording, so they only look after the royalties that come from sales. Um, I think also sales include things like streams now, like Spotify, iTunes or Apple Music or whatever. But traditionally it was only sales, whether it be vinyl, cassette, CD, whatever, gramophone. Um, it, they just looked after the sales money from those products. Whereas uh, 
a publisher would look after royalties from licensing fees. So, for example, if I got my track played on BBC Radio 1 today and it was entered into the cue sheets, which made it official, then I would get royalties for that, depending on how much that station pays in a licence fee every year. It gets split between all the tracks that get played throughout that time, so it can be anything from pennies to, uh, I'll say, $200 max for radio, pretty much for a three-minute track. Um, yeah, about that. Uh, so, but I mean, it, it all again. It all depends on whether it's prime time or non-prime time, whether it's local station or national station or international station. Uh, there's a whole host of variants and and reasons that it could be very different amounts of money. But that's generally looked after by the publisher, whereas the sales money is looked after by the record label. Um, so they're two very different things, but sometimes they get a bit complicated and they join forces. Uh, and I think that's a good 15 minute rant on that. Uh, Zombo, heard you heard your music through Mousetrap. Okay, yeah, I asked this about guys or girls watching this video uh, where you'd heard of me. So yeah, through Mousetrap. Sunset86, hey Dom, Instagram, high five. Uh, whatever that is in my 90s headspace. <laughs> Uh, thanks for answering another long question. The answer validated what I thought all along, that art is personal and I only make music to please myself, although if someone likes it, that's always a bonus. I discovered you on YouTube whilst looking for mixed down tutorials, found yours and subscribed soon after, and having discovered you, I also got to hear of your art. That's cool. I didn't... I never really... It's going to sound silly, I suppose, but I never really thought of getting followers through YouTube. <laughs> I say on a YouTube video. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm a dumbass. Uh, Ricky John, Instagram, high five. Always sounds like a good alias for a drug dealer. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Uh, happy Friday, dog. Can confirm I only heard of you through Mousetrap, but still very glad I did. Yeah, I think that's probably the general consensus. So I, I, I was talking about uh whether it's worth signing to big record labels or not and i mentioned mousetrap and i said chances are most of you have heard of me through mousetrap uh things felt a bit more deep uh in parts this week and in some parts quite relatable introversion and such uh big respects to you my sir uh as to what you asked about the camera, it appears sharper and closer this week, I think. Yeah, definitely sharper and, well, definitely closer because I had zoomed in a bit and I don't know why I did that. I felt like it was a better shot. Um, hopefully it's better again this week. I can see on the screen that the monitor looks a bit... What is that? 50 hertz flicker, I suppose. I don't know if that comes out in the final video. I've also finally got my uh, neon LEDs behind the acoustic panel as well, so hopefully it looks a bit better this week and it's generally cleaner and whiter. Uh, on to some questions which hopefully you'll be able to answer. This week and next, I'm on double shift, so try to get myself a sub-37. First question on this is, do you think it will pair well with Earthquaker's Data Corruptor, primarily a guitar pedal, because that's also on the shopping list? <laughs> yeah, I think any analog synth can be paired with any guitar pedal. I've got one somewhere myself. Um, I don't use it anymore, but that's more because it was just a fiddly pedal. Uh, because that's also on the shopping list, but since it's meant to make a meant for making a guitar sound like a fuzzy octavey square, I wasn't sure if it would make very interesting textures on a synth or just sit and gather dust after one use. <sighs> yeah, that's a tricky one. I, I, if I'm honest, I think it'd probably sit and gather dust. Um, only because I mean, you you could get creative and have some creative sounds in there for sure, but I'm not sure if there's much in the terms of making it really unique and distinctive. Um, yeah, I don't know, so I'm 50-50 on the pedal if that's your only use. If you've got a guitar, then obviously that's a different story. Uh, question number two, uh, as for the Sub-37, I recommend it to everyone. Um, it's 
probably my all-time favorite synth that I've ever owned at least or ever used um, because it's just so versatile but one thing I will mention is I, I said something similar on Instagram funnily enough um, a couple months ago and someone said that they'd bought one and found it too fiddly and it was their first analog synth and they found it too fiddly and cumbersome and they ended up getting rid of it which is absolutely fair enough um, and I will point that out as well as, as much as I recommend the Sub 37 to everyone um, I think it's also worth noting that if it's your first analog synth and don't expect to be able to just power it up and all of a sudden you've written a hit record um, because analog synths I, and any hardware synths, I guess, really, you know, you, you're dealing with an audio out to an audio into your interface and it's a whole different process in setting it up. It's not like a, a VST where you can dial it up, hit save and recall it 20 minutes later, you know, uh, restart your computer and, you know, if you switch the synth off and then back on again, you've probably lost all your settings and you have to start again or whatever. So it can get very fiddly. So, uh, yeah, I'll also say that. Uh, question number two. Do you have any idea if I will be able to run my Hona B2A electric bass through the Sub 37 for some weirdness? I, there is a CV or, or an audio in, sorry. Uh, I think on the sub 37 there is on the little fatties there must be on the sub 37 I personally I've never used it uh, you should though be able to use the multi diodes uh, distortion saturation uh, filter various bits and pieces so worth giving it a go um, I suppose if not a data corruptor on a bass might be interesting so yes yeah, so it sounds like you're a bass player so in which case uh, the data corruptor might be a good idea just for the hell of it anyway whether they pair with each other or not is a different thing anyhow uh, thanks as always Dom have a great weekend thank you very much you too uh, deadly custard where are we on time I think we're okay I can see my battery is a bit low as well uh, a good and interesting rant though, Dom. Instagram, high five. Always fascinating to hear some truths about the industry. I've always liked the idea of releasing on a label as it feels like a bit of a cred and a kind of validation that what I've made appeals at, to at least one other person. Yeah, and I think that's an important thing with releasing on record labels. I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, a long time ago. Um, record labels used to be what I always called the shit filter. Um, if you manage to get a record signed in the 90s then that record label was most likely investing huge amounts of money on getting it pressed getting it mastered getting it mixed down getting a studio with all the synths and everything to to record it in the first place it took an inordinate amount of work to get a finished record in the 90s um, which meant there had to be some kind of shit filter you couldn't just release any old shit because nobody was going to risk that amount of money you know you were looking at sort of anything from three to ten grand minimum just for a, a, a basic release on a, a dance record so um, I think that's quite important to understand that these days record labels kind of don't need to do that so if you're releasing with a bigger label that does do whether it be CD releases or even merchandise or almost unrelated stuff, but a label that builds a brand and a following, if if you're able to sign your track to them, then yeah, absolutely, you, you know, that's a huge thing for your credibility. Um, and it means that somebody is willing to risk their brand on your art and that you need to, whether the record makes any money or not, you need to understand that you guys who are signing records to somebody who's investing time and energy and money and whatever there is into these things and into your art that's a huge deal whether it's a success financially or not um, that is a huge deal so you've got to pat yourself on the back for that regardless uh, Rod Marconi Instagram high five hey Dom started following you, uh, yourself after reading your articles in future music magazine many years ago geez yeah that was many years ago um, Christ, when was that? Couldn't even tell you. Probably Future Music, I did articles for them around, was it 2010, something like that, I think? Nearly 10 years ago. Uh, high five to Rob Marconi then, long time follower. 
Uh, Jadranko Vitaic. Uh, Hi, Dom. Thanks for the answer. That was it. Cool. You were, uh, you're welcome. Uh, is that Coil? Uh, discovered you and many other great artists through Mousetrap. I think that person is correct in that good art speaks for itself and can build an audience. Absolutely. But funding will go much further than anything else when it comes to building a brand, which props up artists that the brand knows have a good shot at building an audience. Absolutely. And they go hand in hand. Uh, money and gatekeepers at the end of the day are what determines an artist's success, not just the art itself. Unfortunately, you're right. Um, you know, I wish that just great art could be just great art, but we live in a capitalist world where things cost money, you know, whether it be redecorating rooms or building garden offices or just eating food. Um, you know, these things all cost money and that in turn makes us, as artists, we kind of have to sucker up a bit and, and you know, we want to make money from our art. It's as simple as that. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we sometimes have to rely on, as you say, the gatekeepers of these things um, who have the money to be able to make or break. And to that extent, we've all got to play a game. And I always sort of tell you guys that, you know, I, I try not to play the game, but obviously I have to to an extent because otherwise I'd starve. Um, but at the same time, I always try and steer my career into a direction where, yes, hopefully I'll make some money, but I, you know, I, I've mentioned before, I've turned down jobs before where I thought, you know what, I don't want my name on that. I don't think I'd be proud of that. And, um, you know, some of those have been for good money. And uh, to me, it's, you know, you've got to find that balance. And I guess it's up to you on where that balance is. For some people, there is no balance. Um, it is what it is. Uh, I think the tides are changing and creative artists can build a brand easier than ever with less money than ever. But you can't deny the impact that a big label like Mousetrap has in increasing the visibility of artists. Absolutely. And I will also say that Mousetrap have a great artistic element as well. There's, there's, I think they deserve more credibility than they get for their artistic intent in the label um, and that's probably the fundamental reason why I'm signed to them. Um, I can see it's just coming up to the 30 minute marker point so I'm gonna hit reset on the camera now before it cuts out and I'm back. Um, right, BWO official Instagram Dom, high five. Uh, then it's the last one here, feel the beat. Hey Dom, last time I commented in one of your videos it was, I think, in last year. Glad you are still making these. Me too. Uh, even if I hate that app, I'll say it, Instagram. <laughs> uh, I had two questions for you on oh, High Five. Uh, how is it, how it was when you heard Sistema's remix of Structures for the first time? Personally, I was like, no way, it's so good. And then I heard his episode of For Lack of a Better Radio, I had no words. In terms of music production, how would you describe his music? Uh, I low passed his sub on structures and it had a bit of stereo uh, information and yet there was a lot of artists who say to keep it mono. Um, okay, I've never uh, low passed his remix so I, I wouldn't know um, but it sounds great nonetheless. I think, you know, as a general rule it's always good to keep things mono down in the low subs. The reason for that is you can get phasing issues but but the reality is you don't get phasing issues very often, um, especially if you're using digital synths, you know, the, those, you know, whether it be a sine wave, square wave, whatever, the waveforms on left and right are going to be absolutely in sync on a digital synth. Um, it's only when you're loading in effects and maybe filters as well, then you might get phasing issues. Um, but it's just good practice to keep the low frequencies in mono. So, you know, uh, take it with a pinch of salt, I guess. Um, in terms of how I felt when I first saw his or heard his remix, um, do you know what? There were there were probably seven or eight remixes amongst that that whole competition where I genuinely thought, "Damn, that's a really good remix." You know, and and of those, even though even then there were a few that maybe weren't quite right in the mix, or maybe could do with a better master, or maybe could have 
done this, that and the other. They were, you know, there's always going to be something that could have been better. And I think, you know, that's true for everything anyway. But even then, I, I really like, you know, some of the, I think what I'm trying to say is I liked different remixes for different reasons. There were a couple in there, I, I, you know, the drum and bass one stands out. Uh, in fact, I think the guy who made that drum and bass one watches these videos, so high five to you. Um, you know, that, that one kind of stood out to me just because it was a totally different take. And I th and I remember sort of thinking, yeah, that's great. That That's kind of what I wanted was just something totally different. Um, and uh, there were a couple of ambient ones that were really good. And there was one that was almost classical, um, which again, I thought sounded fantastic. So I think that's the biggest thing I was looking for was just something a bit different, a bit more creative, a bit, just a whole different take on my track. Uh, Sistemes did that, but not only did he do that, it was well balanced and well mixed and everything that was fine, but not that I was especially looking for that because I was actually prepared to offer the right track, a mix down from me or a master from me anyway. So it wasn't, it wasn't essential that it was perfectly mixed. It was the production itself I was looking for. Um, so yeah, so with the Sistemas one, I just felt it just banged basically there wasn't really any any other way I could describe it um it just hit the nail on it and it made me go yeah this is the one that did like I couldn't have um I just didn't feel there was anything missing from it and and not only that also I was very aware that it had to be released by Mousetrap and essentially I was acting as a and R for Mousetrap in that moment as well so I felt like the overall sound of it and everything kind of fit in better with Mousetrap as well than some of the others. Uh, you know, for example, there, there was that classical one, which I really liked. Um, I don't think it was quite up there anyway in the top, but even if it was the best production ever in classical, I'm not sure if I would have really chosen that to get released by Mousetrap anyway. Um, I would have certainly had to have spoken to them first and gone, is this right? Do you want this? You know, because they might, you know, it might not fit. So there's always that to bear in mind. Uh, my second question is about production. I've been thinking something about mixing lately, and that's about balancing sounds in a song. I've started thinking there's a lot of misconception, uh, don't know if that's the right word, about approaching a mix. People on YouTube, forums, etc. talk a lot about plugins and that a uh, compressor or that saturation plugin etc when in reality or at least in my reality uh, the most important tool once you have more or less the right sounds are the volume faders yeah pretty much uh, for example when creating a drum groove hi-hats kick clap perks etc uh, the first thing i do once i have a pattern is to balance the sounds before touching eq to filter out harshness or whatever and then once I feel the groove, I know if some sounds needs some processing. What do you think about this approach? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, first and foremost, a good mix down should be about getting the levels right. And it's about the balance. Um, you know, yes, you don't want too much sub in a kick. Um, you know, if it's too thundery down low, especially if you've got certain bass frequencies that clash with it or, you know, um, anything along those lines but at the same time you definitely don't want a snare drum that's 5 db above everything else because that's just going to destroy the listener um so yeah so the, the the levels really are the fundamental part of a mix down and those are the the key things to focus on uh, and then the next thing to focus on is getting rid of things that shouldn't be there whether that be low end in a hi-hat or high frequencies in a mid-range synth or or low frequencies in a mid-range synth or something along those lines um, and and then once you've done that then you can sort of move on to things like spatial awareness and dynamics and compressors and things like that and and you're right you know people on youtube bang on about compressors this and saturators that and you know really they're kind of the last things you know you you, you want your mix to sound really tight before you even think about putting a compressor on top of it. Um, that's my view and my approach anyway. I know a lot of people just chuck compressors like there's no tomorrow and, and 
okay maybe that glues things together but to me it just sounds squashed and and there's no real sort of balance in there then it's you know you're forcing the balance and not thinking about it um so that's what i think about this approach you're closer to the end result of a track if you start balancing sounds than if you keep playing with that eq or that compressor that's what i mean thank you for your time have a great week cheers that my friends is the end of this week's ama um Hopefully I'll be back again normal time next week on Friday and uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you then. Cheers.